uh, I'm going to um, go into the uh, PowerPoint presentation, which I hope uh, you can see uh, reasonably well, and uh, which of course you'll have access to after the lecture if you want to go over it um, yourself. Uh, as with yesterday, um, I'll try and talk for about 45 minutes and leave 15 minutes open for questioning. Um, okay, so let me call up, try and call up the, uh, the point. And here we are. So I just want to check and could you, I'm presuming that everybody can hear me okay. Lance, can you assure me that uh, we're all connected and everything? Um, yes, John, we can hear you perfectly and we can see the PowerPoint. Okay, good. Well, let's, you know, from yesterday's um, talk, I tried to give you some general bearings for understanding Joyce's Ulysses, uh, particularly understanding it as a modernist text, some of the uh, political reality which was driving modernism as an aesthetic movement. And I wanted to narrow the focus a little bit today by drawing down into um, the Irish, specifically Irish modernism, of which Joyce was both a part, but also a part, a part in the sense of making himself different from. Irish modernism begins in the late 19th century, perhaps uh, when Yeats publishes the Celtic Twilight, a collection of folk tales and poems and writings of earlier Irish writers. It's a part of that political modernism where the Irish were very keen in asserting their nation and their national identity as distinct from the British occupiers, began to invest heavily in the Irish language and in certain ideas of building an Irish canon and Irish literature. In 1893, the Gaelic League began promoting the learning of Irish language, which had been dying away for some time. In 1897, the great poet and dramatist William Butler Yeats wrote his manifesto for the Irish Literary Theatre, along with a number of other people. And in 1904, the National Theatre of Ireland, the Abbey Theatre, was, was founded. Yeats, Singe, O'Casey, many others became um, worldwide figures in a new Irish nationalist drama. Joyce, however, wanted to or felt he had to take his distance from that uh, uh, identity literature of Ireland. And I thought it would be interesting before we go on to the question of realism to look at the his response to the founding of the Irish Literary Theatre in a review essay he wrote in 1901. And you'll see that he is kind of in favour of it, but also not in favour of it. He writes, the Irish Literary Theatre is the latest movement of protest against the sterility and falsehood of the modern stage. Well, he says, it partly made good on its word and was expelling the old devil, meaning by that the sort of tired 19th century dramatic traditions. When after the first encounter, the Irish literary theatre surrendered to the popular will. Now, he says, your popular devil is much more dangerous than your vulgar devil. If an artist courts the favour of the multitude, he cannot escape the contagion of its fetishism and deliberate self-deception. And if he joins in a popular movement, he does so 
at his own risk. The Irish literary theatre, by its surrender to the trolls, has cut itself adrift from the real line of advancement. And there you have the young Joyce um, striking out in a characteristic way of pursuing his own path away from what he calls the contagion of fetishism, the deliberate self-deception, which he found uh, to be the danger of joining in a popular nationalist literary movement. Um, I'll be talking much more about Joyce's response to uh, a specifically Irish modernism in the final lecture this week, but I wanted to use that to set the stage for discussing realism, because the first feature we might note here in this particular quotation from Joyce is the thing that he's in favour of, which is the attack on the sterility and falsehood of the modern stage. In this Joyce's hero was not to be Yeats or any of the other Irish literary theatre notables. It was rather uh, the Norwegian dramatist Ibsen. Ibsen was undoubtedly one of Joyce's uh, literary heroes in this period and had a profound effect on him. And it's from Ibsen, I think, that he draws some of his own particular understanding of what realism is, what realism does, how it should be, and which motivates uh, the first portion of his literary endeavours, as these came to fruition in the collection of short stories called Dubliners, which I'll be talking about before we move into Ulysses proper. Once again, though, just to get a grip on Joyce's extraordinary genius, let me remind you of something I said yesterday, that Joyce is extremely unusual in being a master of three different modes of aesthetic expression, the realist, the modernist, but also the postmodernist. And here <clears throat> I've put... Uh, a quote from Joyce about Dubliners, which I'll come back to in a moment, next to a typical realist picture of, you wouldn't believe, I don't think, that the picture on the left, the painting on the left, is by none other than Picasso. Picasso, like Joyce, or Joyce like Picasso, begins his artistic endeavours as a realist. In the Picasso painting, you see the uh, detailed play of light and shadow, the careful folds and drapes of the blankets and the clothing, all the things which make a kind of photographic realism of that picture. Joyce also believed in that degree of photographic realism and would endeavour to present it in his early realist writings. And he had a reason for doing so, which he expressed in some correspondence about the fate of Dubliners, that I seriously believe that you will retard the course of civilization in Ireland by preventing the Irish people from having one good look at themselves in my nicely polished looking glass. And I'd just like you to underline in your mind at least that phrase, my nicely polished looking glass. That's a figure of speech of art as a mirror, which is absolutely crucial to uh, decades and centuries indeed of realism, the idea of art as a mirror to reality. I'll be talking a little bit more about Dubliners in a moment. But remember that like the great artist Picasso, Joyce also had his modernist period and Ulysses, along with a portrait of the artist as a young man, is the prime example of that. I've twinned a little quotation from Ulysses with another painting by Picasso, very different in quality and tone from the previous one, in which we see what I'm calling Picasso's uh, modernism, the ways in which this picture, while recognizably of people in a particular place, 
is imbued with the artist's subjectivity, with the interpretation of the reality, rather than a claim for an absolutely truthful depiction. Uh, in comparison, uh, sorry, I've got a strange message. In comparison to that, sorry, a little quotation from Ulysses. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him. As he and others see me, who chose this face for me, this dog's body to rid of vermin? And I've just chosen those uh, three or four sentences to show you what I'll be talking about more uh, today and tomorrow. The transition between realism and the modernist emphasis on subjectivity in Ulysses. In the first sentence, we have a straightforward, as it were, realist sentence. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him. You know Stephen is there, you know he's bending forward, he's looking at the mirror which is held out to him by somebody else, by Mulligan, in fact. The next sentence are a breakthrough into Stephen's internal stream of consciousness. You enter directly into his thoughts. And I've italicized that, it's not italicized in the novel itself. As he and others see me, who chose this face for me, this dog's body to rid of vermin? And one of the uh, difficult things on first reading Ulysses is that the text has to teach you to distinguish between the realist writing and the moments when it enters into the consciousness of Stephen in this chapter. Uh, that makes it, until you get used to it, something which at first you can't understand. And it's very important to get hold of that moment, first moment of not understanding in order to grasp the reality of Joyce's major innovation in making stream of consciousness a new thing in uh, fiction. But I'll be talking about all that as we go along. As for postmodernism, well, the uh, image, another painting from Picasso, again, is much further away from any uh, understandable depiction of the real, though not entirely divorced from it. It's very interested in formal construction and abstraction. And in these ways, just as Picasso um, lived through and created three very different aesthetics for himself, so does Joyce. And uh, with Finnegan's Wake, you can see a style which is very distinct from modernism uh, and is what I think now we would call the postmodern. And I'll just read a little bit of it. Well, you know, or don't you ken it, or haven't I told you every telling has a tailing, and that's the he and the she of it. Look, look, the dusk is growing, my branches lofty are taking root, and my cold cheer's gone ashley. Filur, filou. What age is at? Its sown is late. Tis endless now, Senna Io, Eri Warner, Lasso, Waterhouse's clock. They took it asunder, I heard them sigh. When will they reassemble it? And I think you might really like, if you haven't heard it before, to take the opportunity at some point to hear a recording of James Joyce himself reading this passage from An Olivia Plorabelle in Finnegan's Wake, which you can find on YouTube in the, at the address given in the slide. I find it so absolutely extraordinary that we can actually hear Joyce uh, reading Finnegan's Wake and it's so easily accessible. So I, I, I'd strongly recommend that to you. There are also, if you look around, there are also um, uh, clips of him reading from Ulysses and other texts. So Joyce's mind and creativity is able to express itself through three very different forms of expression, through a realist mode of writing, 
through a modernist mode of writing, which he creates, and through a postmodernist mode, which he also invents and creates. It's an extraordinary set of critical achievements. Um, today, though, I want to focus particularly on realism, because you can't really understand how modernism emerges in Joyce thinking until you see how deeply rooted he was in modernism. And Joyce's period of realism comes in the short stories gathered together and accepted to be published uh, by a British publisher, Grant Richards, in 1906, um, a year or so after Joyce had left Ireland and moved to Trieste, the first of some uh, peripatetic adventures across Europe. Although completed in 1905, the book was not published until 1914. Frustrated with the lack of response from Grant Richards, Joyce was encouraged to send it to the Irish literary movement publisher, Mounsell & Co. in Dublin. And here it was at first printed, but then when the printers read it, the copies were burned. Dubliners was just really as controversial as Ulysses proved to be. And it's something we might bear in mind as we think about Joyce from a uh, hundred years later, just how radically um, unpopular uh, Joyce was with the literary establishment in, its, in the first moments of his reception. The main issue um, for the Dublin publishers and the English publishers was the representation of King Edward VII in one of the short stories um, of the book, uh, uh, where King, the king is described in the following terms, He's just an ordinary knockabout like you or me, and he likes a drink and so on and so forth. Uh, people thought this was much too shocking to, to have the king represented in this way. And it points to um, a, one of the key uh, dimensions of realism, that realism tends to focus on the lives of ordinary people of working people of the lower classes, as you can see in a typical realist piece of painting on the left hand side of the screen. Not the rich, not the famous, but the poor and the ordinary. This is the domain of realism. And one of the chief aims of the stories in Dubliners and um, Joyce's work in that book is to offer a representation of very ordinary life in Dublin. The thing is, with this kind of realism, it raises the hackles of people as it's, it's perceived to be too much, uh, too shocking. And Dubliners was regarded by many and this is partly what held up its printing, not just the reference to the king, but to virtually all the stories in it, are in a sense unapologetically sordid. They show a part of reality which it's held that aesthetic works shouldn't countenance, even if they're being realistic in some ways. I'll just give you two examples. Uh, I mean, each story in its own way is, is kind of rather shocking when you, when you think about it. Uh, two Gallants is the story of two Dublin men and um, their attitudes towards women. And um, the, one of them is successful at extorting money from um, a woman he's seeing and taking advantage of. And the title of the story, Two Gallants, refers, if you like, to that kind of lying sort of literature that Joyce didn't approve of. Remember when we talked about how he didn't like uh, 19th century drama and so on, found it to be unrealistic. Two Gallants are 
call up stock figures of romance and niceness and uh, almost aristocratic sort of bearing. A part of the irony of the story is that these two gallants are far from gallant. They're, they're mean, they're nasty, they're sordid. They're, I suppose we'd say, deeply sexist now. They take advantage of the women they get involved with. And it's really a nasty, nasty story. Uh, he's one of the guys who's looking back on uh, one of his previous uh, inamoratas saying, she's on the turf now, meaning she's a, become a prostitute. I suppose that's your doing, said Lenahan. There was others at her before me, said Corley philosophically. And again, in that sort of writing, you have Joyce's mastery of expression as while Corley claims he's speaking philosophically, the things he says are so violent and despicable. There were others at her before me. At her sounds like dogs attacking another animal. And here he's referring to his uh, sexual relations with a previous uh, woman he's been seeing. There was others at her before me, said Corley philosophically. It's an absolutely sordid representation of masculinity, one that the printers surely wouldn't have liked because they may well have recognised themselves in it. And that was, of course, Joyce's aim, to present a realistic picture with all its grime, with all its nastiness. Similarly, in another story called An Encounter, this is a story of two boys who um, run off from school for a day to have some adventures, get on a train, travel around a bit, go and eat somewhere there in a meadow, and a strange man accosts them and rambles on at them about, uh, about love and desire. After a long while, his monologue paused. This is the monologue of the man who's accosted the two young boys, about 10 years old. He stood up slowly, saying that he had to leave us for a moment or so. And he does, he goes off to the edge of the field. I say, look what he's doing. As I neither answered nor raised my eyes, Mahoney exclaimed again, I say, he's quite a queer old josser. Well, without saying it, um, the indication is that the man is masturbating, that he's being excited by his talking to the two boys. And it's, again, just a very sordid, unapologetically sordid piece of the real. I mean, it's it's not surprising that Dubliners had trouble getting published. It's a realistic book which isn't afraid of talking about the grimiest parts of reality. Uh, and it was part of Joyce's aim to represent the world in a true and realistic fashion. You can see Joyce's strong interest in upholding of realism in, in many of his uh, critical writings, essays and pieces of journalism and addresses to societies uh, in this early period. In a famous talk called Drama and Life given on January 20th, 1900, he writes, it may be asked what we are to do what we are to do as writers, in the words of Tolstoy. First, clear our minds of Kant and alter the falsehoods to which we have lent support. I think out of a dreary sameness of existence, a measure of dramatic life may be drawn. Even the most commonplace, the deadest among the living, may play a part in a great drama. Life we must accept as we see it before our eyes, men and women as we meet them in the real world, not as we apprehend them in the world of fairy. 
And with that reference to the world of fairy, that is the world of the Celtic twilight of Yeats and others writing alongside Joyce in this period. Joyce's commitment at this early stage is an absolute commitment to a very strong and deliberate form of realism, one we associate today with writers such as Zola in particular, but also, although in a more complex way, with Gustave Flaubert. Indeed, as Ezra Pound in one of the first reviews of Dublin is to be published uh, wrote, the followers of Flaubert deal in exact representation. Joyce is a realist. He gives the thing in itself. He gives us Dublin, as presumably it is. Joyce then, the realist. Yes, Joyce was a realist. Dubliners is a masterpiece of realism to stand easily alongside the writings of a Zola, a Balzac, or uh, any other of the 19th century realists. But he goes beyond it. He does something else with it. He develops out of it. To introduce that sort of development and that change, that move away from realism, which you could only make if you were in realism in the first place, I thought we'd begin looking at Ulysses by looking at what that exact representation, that exact presentation that Pound speaks of means in practice in Ulysses. And for this, uh, I'd suggest you read the penultimate episode of Ulysses, or at least a few paragraphs or pages from that strange, strange chapter. Again, I'm beginning with this so as to give you a helping hand with reading such an odd chapter. Because, of course, if you can see what's going on in it, then you're much more able to deal with it. Episode 17 is called Ithaca. It's in parallel with the episode in the Odyssey where Odysseus meets his son, Telemachus, and they begin to uh, clear out the suitors of Penelope and to get back home. Uh, in Joyce's novel, that is happening, but in a very different way. Uh, episode 17 deals with Bloom and Stephen wending homewards rather drunk and uh, with Bloom inviting Stephen to stay for the night and Bloom acting as a kind of father figure towards Stephen. The narrative mode which Joyce identifies as at work in this chapter, he refers to in his notes on the book which I've put in your um, in the uh, accompanying materials, uh, which you should have received, is one of impersonal catechism, he calls it. As you know or may know, uh, catechism is uh, a set of fixed questions with fixed answers that play a large part in uh, being a Catholic. And impersonal catechism is similarly a series of fixed questions with fixed answers but in a more general sense. So you'll find that episode 17 is a series of questions and a series of answers and the answers to the questions are extremely realistic. They're factual, they're realistic to the nth degree. Did it flow? question about the water in the pipes of Dublin. Yes, from Roundwood Reservoir in County Wicklow of a cubic capacity of 2,400 million gallons percolating through a subterranean aqueduct of filter mains of single and double pipage constructed at an initial plant cost of £5 per linear yard by way of the Dargle 
Rathdown, Glen of the Downs and Callow Hill to the 26-acre reservoir at Stillogan, a distance of 22 square miles, and thence through a system of relieving tanks by a gradual fleet to the city boundary at Eustace Bridge. Well, there you have, if you like, a masterpiece of realist writing and all the tricks of realist writing. When answering the question, did it flow, you get an extremely detailed and factual description in which one detail rests on another, which rests on another, so you get a closer and closer kind of magnification of what's really going on. What I mean is, it doesn't just say the water flows from Roundwood Reservoir to the city boundary. It flows from Roundwood Reservoir in County Wicklow, giving you a further position as to where Roundwood Reservoir is. And then of a cubic capacity of 2,400 million gallons, and then an extremely detailed set of descriptions of what's involved in all that, percolating through a subterranean aqueduct, a filter mains, not just of pipage, but of single and double pipage, not just of pipage, single and double, but constructed, we are told, at initial plant cost of five pounds per linear yard, and so on and so forth. It's really both a piece of realism and a parody of realism. And Joyce's uh, point in doing this is to show us that realist writing is a form of writing. Uh, it breaks the magical spell of a novel which is conducted through character and plot and takes us instead into the construction of realist forms of representation and expression. It's intended to be funny. Joyce is deeply serious as an artist, but a big part of his writing is comic. And so uh, the way to read this chapter is as a kind of joke. Uh, and you have to be able to laugh at, with Joyce at Ulysses as he puts in things which are meant to be exaggerated and ridiculous and just plain funny. So episode 17 shows Joyce's mastery of realism, but also in a sense his farewell to it or his ability to get beyond it and to make a parody of it, something which you can't really do if you're just deep inside it, you're unlikely to parody it. How does Joyce get away from it? Well, I'll try and explain that in a moment. But just to help you engage with this first episode, with now with this first episode, Telemachus, which I suggested you have a look at for today, I wanted to, you know, in a very simple way, show you one of the things that connects Ulysses to Homer's Odyssey. And I'm going to do this through a wonderful, precise description from that great critic, Eric Auerbach, and his masterpiece of writing, Mimesis, where he talks about the basic impulse of the Homeric style. And he describes this as the imperative to represent phenomena in a fully externalized form, visible and palpable in all their parts, and completely fixed in their spatial and temporal relations. This kind of representation is realist representation in, in particular. Uh, fully externalized, completely fixed, visible and palpable. And just take one stanza in translation from Homer's Odyssey. You can see how that works. He led the way and Pallas Athena followed into the lofty hall. 
Okay, the hall is not just a hall, the lofty hall gives you a sense of the spatial relation of the hall. The boy reached up and thrust his spear, thrust, sorry, thrust her spear high on a polished rack against a pillar where tough spear on spear of the old soldier, his father, stood in order. Then, shaking out a splendid coverlet, he seated her on a throne with footrest all finely carved and drew his painted armchair near her at a distance from the rest. Well, just look at the detail there. And I want to suggest to you that one definition of realism is that you pile one detail on another till you get this photographic three-dimensional kind of representation. So the boy, it's important, doesn't just thrust the spear onto the polished rack. Uh, the polished rack is itself described as being against a pillar and the rack also contains spear on spear of the old soldier and you hear a bit about who he is and how all these stand in order. He seated her on a throne, but not just a throne, a throne with a footrest and not just a footrest, but finely carved footrest and drew his armchair, but not just his armchair, a painted armchair near her at a distance from the rest. Every detail contributes to trying to give you a kind of in-depth photographic image of the reality depicted. Ulysses deploys that mode, the basic impulse of Homeric style, the realist impulse, the representation of phenomena in a fully externalized form over and over again, all the way through. One part of Ulysses is a fantastic realist novel. Here's just one example uh, from actually from the second episode. A bag of fig rolls lay snugly in Armstrong's satchel. He curled them between his palms at whiles and swallowed them softly. Crumbs adhered to the tissues of his lips. I'd just like you to dwell on that description. Crumbs adhered to the tissues of his lips. It's a very fine and precise description. It's realist writing at its most cinematic and visual. Not just there were crumbs on his lips, but crumbs adhered, not just to the lips, but to the tissues of his lips. You're given a writing which takes you deeper and deeper into the real. But like I said, the point of um, getting a grip on the depth of Joyce's commitment to realism is to see and understand how out of that something new emerges. And this already begins in the first episode where time and time again, the uh, realist narration is interrupted in ways which at first, as a reader, I think you're likely to find very difficult to follow. And it's one of the first things I'd ask you to do is in reading the episode, just spot those moments where you're puzzled. And you often find that those moments are the ones where the narration changes, changes gear, if you like, from the realist mode to the stream of consciousness subjective mode. And just to give you an idea of that and what to look for and what to spot, uh, give you two examples. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Again, that classic realist description in which you get really cinematically placed so that you can see or imagine you see where somebody is. Stephen stands up, he goes over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mail boat, clearing the harbour mouth of Kingstown. And again, see the way in which realism works 
by piling one detail on another, articulating it with another, till you get what appears to be a photographic reproduction of that moment of the real. Leaning on the parapet, Stephen doesn't just look down on the water. He looks down on the water and on the mailboat, and not just on the mailboat, but with the information that the mailboat is coming from Kingstown, but not just Kingstown, but from the harbour mouth of Kingstown. Each de detail rests upon another, like a building is made up of one brick placed upon another. It gives you the solidity of the realist depiction that Auerbach celebrated in Homer and Joyce um, performs in Ulysses. However, as you read the chapter, <coughs> you'll also see that uh, there are moments when the text ceases to work in this purely realist fashion, where you see the outside of things and you see people in a three-dimensional empirical reality. The moments that are at first puzzling are the moments when you suddenly fall through the real. You fall through the real and the external detail and into, literally into, the minds of the characters as if the text is suddenly becoming telepathic. Suddenly you're inside the minds of the characters, as in this moment here. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him cleft by crooked crack, hair on end. Now what happens in the next sentence is that without explanation, and this is what puzzles you as an initial reader, without it saying, he thought, in other words, suddenly you're inside Stephen's mind, inside his stream of consciousness. Let me read it again, it's slightly different to exaggerate that. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him, cleft by crooked crack, hair on end. As he and others see me, who chose this face for me, this dog bossy to rid of vermin? It asks me too. You see, you're suddenly not observing Stephen from the position of the traditional omniscient narrator or like a film director from outside. Suddenly you're inside Stephen's mind. And this technique um, gathers force in the first episodes of Ulysses and of course culminates in the extraordinary final episode, Penelope, where were given uh, insight, the insight that Jung uh, really appreciated, as we saw yesterday, into the mind of Molly Bloom. But I'll be talking more about that tomorrow um, as we uh, move on to talk, move from realism to modernism. This is just a, a taste of it today. Now, Ulysses, like Dubliners before it, was a tremendously controversial work and appeared in print several times and was destroyed, confiscated, banned before uh, it was eventually allowed to be read by a larger public. Why was that? What was the fuss about? Well, I'm going to read you a few responses to Ulysses, which show you something of what was at stake in Joyce's writing. For the great Virginia Woolf, herself a genius of the modern period, well, although there are many uh, uh, similarities between them, you'd think she would have, writing Mrs. Dalloway, you'd think she would like Joyce. No, she wasn't keen on Joyce. Underbred, the book of a self-taught working man, of a queasy undergraduate scratching his pimples, Mm, not very complimentary, but full of class animus. Joyce was, of course, not a member of the Bloomsbury group, not from a rich family, was really a poor sort of guy who, through an extraordinary devotion, did turn himself into uh, a towering genius in the aesthetic world. 
Uh, I was reminded preparing for the lectures that his trajectory is very like that of the South African author J.M. Katsia, someone whose devotion to art um, was was really uh, intense and led to an extraordinary transition from being uh, an ordinary uh, math student to becoming uh, one of the great writers of his century. George Moore was an Irish writer, a near contemporary of Joyce, is a member of that Irish literary revival that I mentioned previously. And he sees in Joyce a sort of Zola gone to seed. Like I said before, that's the realist element. A comparable writer with Dubliners is, is, is Zola and with the realist elements of, of Ulysses. Probably Joyce thinks because he prints all the dirty little words, he's a great novelist. Joyce, Joyce, why he's nobody. He's from the Dublin docks. No family, no breeding. Ulysses is hopeless. It's absurd to imagine that any good can be served by trying to record every single thought and sensation of any human being. That's not art. It's like trying to cope, copy the London telephone directory. So Ulysses was uh, dismissed. It was not understood immediately. Uh, and that's uh, something we have to grasp about the novel a hundred years later or 99 years later, is how shocking it was, how in a sense unreadable it was but how, if you give it a chance, the book teaches you to read it as it goes on. As you read and reread it, and I'd just like you to try that experiment, just try, for example, marking where you see the transition from the realist mode of writing to stream of consciousness expression in that first chapter. Rather than being puzzled by what's happening, if you look for it happening, I think you'll find it very satisfying to identify that and to see what's going on. And then, despite what George Moore had to say, you can then begin to get a sense of the tremendous thought and art that has gone in to the making of Ulysses. Uh, let's start with the simple example of the name of the novel. Why is this novel about Dublin called Ulysses? Well, there's quite a lot involved there. And the first thing to note is that Ulysses is the Latin and the English version of the original Greek transliteration of the hero of Homer's Odyssey, Odysseus. Uh, in English, Ulysses you know, is well known in Chaucer and uh, also in Shakespeare, you know, is referenced uh, and particularly in Tennyson's poem, Ulysses becomes the name of Odysseus. This happens, I think, because Joyce was above all interested, as we mentioned uh, yesterday, in the cosmopolitan, in the blending of cultures, and the impossibility, really, of having a single national culture. And Dublin, uh, Ulysses, deals with these questions in an extraordinary way. Just think of, I'll just leave you with one uh, kind of, as our time is running out, I'll just leave you with one reminder of this, that Ulysses is the most Irish novel, and yet its central figure is Jewish, is Bloom. And indeed, it's one of the few novels in the Western canon that, that has a Jew as its hero. Joyce was resolutely anti-nationalistic, and that's something we'll be discussing particularly in the final lecture. Ulysses is a cosmopolitan book set in 
a very narrow and provincial and nationalistic culture of Dublin that Joyce had to get out of that culture to write it is part of what explains why he had to break with realism. Joyce had to break free. And one of the stunning tributes to his genius is how having mastered and he could have rested easily with the realist mode of writing was that he broke through to a completely new form of expression in and through the adoption of modernism, which I'll be talking a little bit more about tomorrow in the third lecture of our series. But let me stop there and open um, open things to um, questions, if there's any questions. Thank you. <clears throat>